I'm delighted to say that Samuel Luckhurst, who is the Chief Manchester United writer with the Manchester Evening News, is with us. Samuel, how are you getting on? Good morning. Very well, thank you. Merry Christmas to you both. Yeah, and to you as well. We're, we're going to talk about um, Erling Haaland because you were on the story this week that Manchester United are incredibly keen on signing him. Like, who in Europe isn't keen on signing a player who's been playing so well over the last two years uh, for Borussia Dortmund? The game changer in many ways, Samuel, is the fact that his release clause comes down to um, probably a much more affordable one for Europe's top clubs at €75 million Euro next summer. Is Ralph Ragnick the key if Manchester United are going to sign him? Because Ragnick would have been involved in his move from Mulde uh, to Red Bull Salzburg once upon a time. And you were writing that uh, Ragnick has a decent relationship with Alfie Haaland as well. That's right. He, he's been speaking to Alfie Haaland uh, ever since he took over the, the role as interim manager of United in a bid to intensify United's interest there just to make sure that they're aware that United still want him. United came close to getting him a couple of years ago when they tried to circumvent Mina Raiola out of a deal and Raiola got wind of that, wasn't too happy. And Raiola, uh, sorry, Haaland ends up going to Borussia Dortmund. But people who knew the family were always adamant that Haaland was, was going to go to Germany, even though it seemed at one point that United were, were favourites to sign him. Raiola came out recently and pretty much whittled down the short list of clubs to City, Barcelona, Real Madrid and Bayern Munich. But then after that came out, I think when he saw it in black and white, he thought, I've, I've restricted myself here. I've narrowed down my options and I need to keep more options open in case another club uh, offers better commission. If, if Manchester United are in a different place in a six months time, would they be a more appealing club than some of those clubs there? So he's rode back on those quotes. And and from United's perspective, there's very little to lose with the pursuit. Um, if, if they're not in for Haaland, then, then questions would be raised as to why they're not in for Haaland. And where, where there's so many forwards that are likely to leave United next year, or certainly attack-minded players, they are going to need a forward. And Haaland's the most coveted uh, in, in world football at the moment. Dealing with Mino Raiola then, like I thought it was very um, tactical on his part to not name Manchester United when he was running through potential candidates. It felt like he was really <coughs> shopping the idea of Haaland going to Spain for next year. But I think he's a practical man who knows that if Haaland gets the movie once, he's going to get well paid along the way. And going to Borussia Dortmund always felt like a bit of a stepping stone for him along the way that he knew that Borussia Dortmund would be a selling club in a couple of years' time. They inserted this clause in the contract to make him affordable after a couple of seasons. I think if Manchester United come in with the money, Raiola will still do a deal. Similarly, if they come with a good contract offer for Paul Pogba, I don't think Raiola is not going to do business with Manchester United. No, I completely agree with you. I mean, Dortmund have become the halfway house for Europe's top talents now. Jude Bellingham, if, if Borussia Dortmund have still got Jude Bellingham uh, beyond the 2023 summer transfer window, they'll have done very well. Everybody fully expects him to leave in 2023. With Raiola, when he did transfer Pogba to United in 2016, Pogba initially uh, was, was intent on going to Real Madrid and Dean Zidane was the coach. They just won the Champions League. Zidane was his boyhood hero as well and, and every elite footballer wants to play for Real Madrid. But Raiola advised him to go to United, try and you know ha have that homecoming, try and make United a force again. And it was on the proviso that he would try and engineer a transfer to Spain uh, three years down the line, which is exactly what he tried to do but failed. So due, due to a number of circumstances, Pogba is still at United. Uh, United haven't signed a Raiola client since Romelu Lukaku in, in 2017, which is clearly a, a conscious decision and also reflects the, the relationship between the two clubs on, on, in terms of uh, player signings anyway. But Ed Woodward, although he's about to hand over the torch to Richard Arnold, uh, has always maintained that he actually gets on quite well with Raiola and, and their relationship is is pretty good, despite what Raiola has said about United in recent years. Samuel, do you mind me asking you, uh, clearly you've probably touched on a, upon it there, I think if he was to sign for United, it's, it's a given United would have to pay a premium to Raiola in terms of commission and even wages, he'd probably have to be earning maybe 10-20% more that he could get at any other those top European clubs for the reason, of course, he wouldn't be guaranteed uh, titles immediately signing for Manchester United uh, in the summer, such as the distance between them and the likes of Manchester City and Liverpool at the moment. But it'd be interesting, do you think there'd be any type of discussion before Haaland came in in terms of his role within the team? Because clearly there'd be players going out the door, Martial, we've heard this morning, Matt and one or two others. But for me, the conversation, as it ultimately is, is about Christian Ronaldo going forward and how would Haaland fit into the team around Christian Rina uh, uh, Ronaldo? There's only one position Ronaldo can play, that's 
to number nine straight down uh, the pitch and predominantly there's only one position Haaland's going to play and he's certainly not going to sign a Manchester United and dovetail with Cristiano Ronaldo as the number nine position for a season or two so do you think there would be a serious discussion there in terms of Haaland coming in and an assurance that he would be Manchester United's number nine and the team would revolve, evolve around him and as a result where does that put Cristiano uh, uh, Ronaldo going forward in the short term? Yeah, it's, it's a key issue there in the way United are playing with the front two at the moment, that there'd be room for Haaland. He, he could play with Ronaldo, but nobody knows if Ralph Rangnick is going to be the next permanent manager of Manchester United. And if he isn't, will the next permanent manager play with a front two? The, the chance, the, the probability is, is unlikely. Um, and in which case would Ronaldo play on the wing? I don't think that you can really do that anymore, even though he's had spells there during games where he has done very well. But I suppose from United's perspective, they can they feel as though they can make a compelling pitch to Haaland in that he can play alongside Ronaldo, which is, is certainly an incentive for just about any player in the world. Um, he can take the number nine shirt because Anthony Martial is an irrelevance these days. He can be the main man at United. Uh, Manchester City achieving things there, although I, I think City are a more suitable club for Haaland in terms of you know, just going there to, to be successful with Manchester City compared to making United a force again. That you know, I, th- I think United is a is a has has bigger bigger play there. But ultimately, United needs to be in the Champions League next season. I think of all the issues there, if they're not in the Champions League next season, Haaland's no go. And at, at the moment, although there's still a long way to go, and they've they've got games in hand on Arsenal, it's far from a guarantee that they will be in the top four at the end of the season. Do you think that motivates players nowadays, particularly young players, Samuel, in terms of being that kind of catalyst for taking Manchester, you know, that pitch to, to Haaland say, look, this is where we're at at the moment. We're a top four uh, team, but we want you to lead us back to the top. We want you to be the catalyst. We want you to, you to create uh, something special here in the next kind of four to six years, as opposed to uh, going up to the Etihad where Guardiola is saying, you're just going to pop straight in there in, into the team. You're going to be a, a cog in the wheel and a very successful wheel in that in terms of guaranteeing trophies in the in the immediate short term. Do you think like young players now buy into that? It's a compelling pitch and it, it can work to an extent. We, you saw with Ronaldo, it worked, although Ronaldo had obviously you know, he'd, he'd played for United for six years, but, but Manchester City were going to sign him until United got wind of it and thought they we, we can't let this happen. With Haaland, I don't think he's going to be at the same mindset as Ronaldo and you've got the father factor there in that um, Alfie Haaland obviously played for City, captain City when they got back to the Premier League in, in 2000. And that, that has its own narrative, if you like, in that he it's, it's the prodigal son returning to Manchester. There's that picture of Haaland as a kid in a Manchester City shirt as well. So wh- whichever club, if, it, if, he, if he does go to one of the clubs in Manchester, uh, either side can pull on the heartstrings and make it seem as though it's not just all about money. I suppose the other issue that City would have is that Guardiola is due to walk away in, in 2023 and just a season working under Guardiola, would that necessarily convince Haaland to to go there in the first place, even though City are a very stable club and a very well-run club, that you would expect them to get the next coaching appointment uh, after Guardiola, right? But I, I think for all intents and purposes, Haaland is just tailor-made for Real Madrid and the prospect of Real Madrid having Haaland and, and Kylian Mbappe in their side next season is a realistic one. And, and that's probably the most compelling pitch of all. Yeah, it's a scary prospect if Real Madrid uh, do manage to get Mbappe, particularly if he's on a free, and if they were able to sign Haaland for somewhere in the region of £75 million. Now, a bidding war could well uh, put it beyond that actual release clause, so we'll see what happens next summer. But uh, both players look like they're going to be available as things stand, uh, despite PSG putting a Mbappe 2050 jersey at his recent birthday celebrations. It seems he's uh, fairly determined to go to Real Madrid. If City were to come in for Erling Haaland, like it's the one piece they're missing at the moment is a number nine, and they've been able to work around it uh, by putting players into the false nine position and using various different combinations up front. But it could be bad news for Harry Kane if City get involved in a war to try and get Erling Haaland next summer, because Kane has had two summers now where it looked like Man City were going to come in, and instead Man City pushed their money to Jack Grealish last year, and Harry Kane was left at Spurs when, to me, it seemed pretty clear he wanted to leave. Well, I think as soon as City weren't going to sign Kane, uh, I, th- I think that it was it all but scuppered the chance of him going there next year. He he will be uh, 29, I think, next summer. 
Haaland is available. Okay, if Haaland doesn't go to City, then they have to look at an alternative. But Kane is clearly not as as enticing a target um, at the moment as he was in the summer. His his form has not been good. He, he looked back to his old self against uh, against Liverpool at the weekend. He doesn't want to be at Tottenham. But that contract he signed in 2018 for six years, which was ludicrously long at the time, I think it's outpriced him of a move. At no point in the summer did Tottenham think that they were ever going to sell him, despite all the uh, posturing that goes with uh, negotiations, which goes with those sagas. Tottenham were always very, very confident that he wasn't going. City were always very confident that they were going to sign him but they never, ever got anywhere near uh, the asking price. You, you knew going into that summer that it was going to take well in excess of £100 million to sign Harry Kane because of his age, because of the length of his contract, his form last season, and because his chairman at Tottenham is, is Daniel Levy. And the Kane brothers rather naively underestimated Daniel Levy, and it was a source of amusement at Tottenham that you know, Charlie Kane, Harry Kane's brother, was, was able thought that he could actually broker that deal and it was just never going to happen even though it was one of those stories that just ran and ran and ran and now Kane's in limbo in that it's very difficult to identify a club that would take him next year you, you could make a tenuous argument for United United are you know, time time served admirers of him but signing another aging forward next year and, and one who has, has played a hell of a lot of football for his age and had some injury issues which have clearly um hampered his uh, hampered his hampered his career to a certain extent and certainly his, his efficacy when he when he has been playing for Tottenham he, he's just not as an, an easy uh, a player to go after next year as I think he has been this year where most clubs in the world would have taken him at that point but it's not worked out that way an aging forward who's probably going to stay at Manchester United because of a departure from Man City now is Edison Cavani. There was plenty of links, uh, particularly in the Spanish media, that Barcelona were interested in signing Cavani, uh, who has been out for quite a while with tendonitis. I think he's missed 11 games uh, for Manchester United in this spell. He's still got a contract that runs till next summer after he extended by a year. But it looks like Cavani is probably going to stay for the rest of the season now that Ferran Torres has gone to the new Camp. Yeah, I think there was some... Um at United, they were a little bit mystified by the reports, the incessant reports linking Cavani with Barcelona. And then all of a sudden you had this Ferran Torres deal come off when everybody thought Barcelona didn't didn't have any money to spend. It, it's, it's a very, very bizarre deal. Uh, it's not necessarily come out of the blue. Torres has been linked with Barcelona for a long time. You, you forget he's even at City, the, the lack of playing time he's had this season. But Cavani to Barcelona never never really seemed to be a goer. It just seemed to be an exercise, an exercise, sorry, in self-preservation for Barcelona to maintain their aura when in reality they're eighth in La Liga and they've just gone out of the Champions League at the group stage. And it, it wouldn't have made much sense for United to get rid of Cavani in, in January, given that they do need uh, presence up front that where, where they are playing with a front two at the moment. He, he is an intense runner when he does play. The problem is he's just not played enough. I think he's only been available for eight games all season. Mm. And so it was just as well that they signed Ronaldo in the summer because coming into this season, Cavani was due to be uh, the starting striker. And dating back to, I think, February and March time, the United medical staff were declaring him fit for games and he would then say, well, I'm not fit to play and would effectively uh, withdraw from the squad. So that was an issue that was rumbling on until April when he caught fire, had a brilliant end to the season and it made extending his contract a pretty simple decision when up until then it, it was quite a nuanced and complicated one because he, he was missing his family, he was in lockdown. Uh, he was, by all accounts, he was having a pretty miserable existence where he couldn't really do anything and didn't particularly like the weather, unsurprisingly. Uh, it, although it's one of those deals that hasn't completely worked out, he has been an asset for United. And when he did play with Ronaldo at Tottenham this season, they had one of their most accomplished victories, albeit against a team with, with a manager that they didn't want and a manager who they then sacked two days later. Samuel, a final one for you just before we let you go and enjoy your Christmas. Manchester United next summer... The winds of change could really be going through the club given the contract situation of some of their players. Lingard, Pogba, Mata, Cavani. There could be a pretty big clear out here potentially. Yeah, and I think the next permanent manager should relish that in that if the decks are cleared, it empowers them to say, well, I need this player and that player, uh, make team-focused signings that are going to 
enhance the team and get the team up to speed. It's it's a pretty good squad, uh, despite where they, they are in the league, despite the, the form in the last months under Ole Gunnar Solskjaer. But they will want a midfielder next year. Uh, they're certainly open to signing a midfielder in the January transfer window, but realistic to know that the chances of getting one who absolutely fits what the mould and fits their profile of, of target is, is unlikely. A forward is going to have to come in, just as you uh, listed there, the amount of attack-minded players that are likely to leave next year. They've got to do something to offset that. They've got a couple of young players coming through who might get their chances under Rangnick. You've already seen Anthony Alanga get some playing time. Hannibal Mejbury has done well at the Arab Cup and might get his chance in the second half of the season as well. But they're certainly going to need two or three uh, significant signings again to really become a credible force and, and finally mount that title challenge that they were supposed to mount this season but didn't. Uh, that, that challenge was over before it even started pretty much because they had the players but they didn't have the manager. Well, Samuel, enjoy the uh, Christmas coming up and the new year and all the festive football. And thanks a million for joining us on OTBAM. Thank you very much.